Hey guys. Okay, I have to do all my checks here to make sure we're actually live. So let's see if the video's going. All right. Good stuff. Okay. Welcome everybody. Uh, huge crowd already. I was like, I looked at the uh, at, at the stream before and, and there was uh, 48 people waiting. That's awesome. Um, it's super excited to have everybody here uh, and uh, hope you guys enjoy this one. Now this one, um, you can kind of prep yourself to maybe ask a few more questions because this is actually, the presentation is a little bit shorter today uh, than the other two, than, than yesterday's was and today's. So um, just be kind of prepared for that. Um, we may have a little bit more time for questions if, uh, if you are so inclined. Um, okay, so while we're kind of waiting for people to gather, um, we again, we, we have about 210 people that were totally, are, were, that were registered. So um, say hi. Where are you from? What's your garden zone? Uh, how cold does it get? Uh, we're going to be talking mostly about um, fall and winter gardening today. We will talk just a little bit about uh, spring gardening as well and, and some of the adjustments that we can make uh, for that. Uh, but um, say hi and tell me where you're from. And I'm turning my phone off so it doesn't block in the middle of the presentation. So, um, Okay, so we've got New York, Maryland, uh, Southern Maryland, uh, close to Washington, D.C., Minnesota, um, there is a workbook, guys, uh, so somebody's asking about that. If you look in the description of this video, you can click on that link. It will take you over um, and uh, there's kind of a little sign-up form and then it will shoot you over to get the, uh, the workbook. So that is down in the description of this video and I'll, I'll talk about that again here in a minute. So we've got uh, South Carolina, a couple of South Carolinas, California, uh, Tennessee, a couple of different Tennessees. Boston, um, Northeastern Tennessee. All right, well, we're up to about 60 viewers. So I think we'll kind of get moving along. Northern California, Oklahoma, um, New Jersey, Louisiana, California. All right, awesome. Okay, so let's kind of get started. I did want to again thank our sponsors. Uh, these two companies, Honest Seed Company and Smart Pots, have both sponsored prizes for this video today. And so I just wanted to make sure that I thanked them so that you guys recognize what they're doing for us there. Um, pretty awesome that they, they were just willing. I, I sent them both an email and, and they were just like, yeah, absolutely. And so they gave us some great prizes for all of these workshops, which is awesome. Um, also, as I was mentioning just a few minutes ago, there is a free workbook that goes along with the, uh, this workshop series. So this is number two uh, in our workshop series. And um, there, there is a workbook that goes along, uh, just one workbook that covers all those days. Uh, link in the description of this video that you can click on and there's a form for you to fill out and then it will let you access and download that workbook. You can print it, uh, whatever you want to do with it. So that is there for you as well. So make sure you check that out. My wife uh, told me to, to remind you guys because she spent a lot of time on that workbook. So she wants to make sure that you guys are, are getting use for that. Um, okay, so welcome to day two of our year-round gardening workshops. Uh, yesterday we talked about base crops and some of the crops that we can grow for fall and winter gardening. Today we're going to talk about timing. We'll mostly be focused on the timing, uh, planting timing for uh, our fall and winter crops, but uh, remind me, I am going to talk just a little bit about some of the things that you can do in the spring as well. Um, and then tomorrow we'll talk about protecting your crops and we're going to talk in particular about hoop houses, fabric row covers, and cold frames. And so um, stay tuned for that. Same time, 2 o'clock mountain uh, that we'll be doing that. Also make sure you hang around. We do have a uh, opportunity for you to get a free course. We actually had 10 people yesterday take advantage of this. We are in the middle of the launch of our year-round gardening master course. And uh, I'll talk more about that after we're done with the presentation, but there is an opportunity for you to get a free course if you sign up for that um, as well. So uh, make sure you stick around to hear that. So here's kind of what we're gonna be talking about today. We're gonna talk about spring planting and uh, 
uh, a little a little bit there and then we're going to talk about fall and winter planting times and and how some of the season extension principles that we're learning can help us with both of those okay so a um, couple of different things for you uh, this class is designed mostly for those of you that live in zones like three through eight where you've got some cold winter and I, I'm already seeing some zones nines and zone tens I don't want to run you off there's still going to be some fun stuff for you guys to learn but we are focused on you know the people that have hardcore winter uh, as well so um, that that's kind of where we're focused we uh, it also helps if you have the ability to start some seeds indoors but it's not hundred percent necessary uh, it sometimes when we're dealing with the timing and I'll talk about this in a bit but as we're dealing with the timing it, it it's beneficial to have a seed starting set up and then for just so that everybody's aware uh, to you know at, at the beginning um, the, you, this is part of our master class series and I am going to be making an offer at the end so after we do the the little class and so if that offends you um, maybe this isn't the right place for you to be but um, I, I just always like to warn people of that because some people don't like that so anyways um, okay, so who am I? My name is Rick Stone. I am the founder of the Gardening Academy and the principal author of Our Stony Acres. I'm also a master gardener and I've been gardening for 23 plus years. Um, my wife and I have been gardening together for that long. Uh, before that, uh, both of us, uh, our parents gardened as well and our grandparents and so we come from big gardening families, um, especially my wife. Her, her family are just amazing gardeners. Um, Okay, uh, just as we're kind of uh, rolling along here, I'm seeing Janetta, uh, Janetta, Janetta uh, is saying for some reason she's unable to get the workbook. Um, so you actually just have to, so you should follow, it'll send you an email and you follow that link and then you just go, it just lands on our website and you can download it from there. If by the time we get this done, you haven't um, been able to find it, uh, and get it to work out, send me an email and we'll, we'll, we'll figure it out. Uh, so I'll get it over to you. Um, but basically I'll just have to send you the link, but we can make that happen. So, um, okay. Um, couple of things that before we get started, uh, I've got about a 10 or 15 minute presentation for you here today. And, uh, during that time, I'm going to kind of ignore the feed for the most part because it, it it'll get distracting and I'll be going off in all kinds of different directions if I do that. So um, kind of hang on to your questions until the end and my wife AJ is upstairs and she is keeping track of questions and we will then get those answered and she's she's gonna stick them over here on a screen for me so that I can then go through and, and answer those um, questions. So. Um, yeah, there we go. Okay, um, I did want to kind of give, an, and for those of you that came yesterday, I apologize, but we have such a diverse um, group that, that uh, you know, I do a, just a little bit of a repeat here. Um, I, I wanted to talk about why we garden year-round. Uh, about, it's been 13 years ago, my wife and I were having a discussion and, and we talked about how good our family ate during the summer, how healthy uh, our family ate. We, you know, we had plates of tomatoes and cucumbers for dinner every night, and just, uh, you know, constantly have this this flow of fresh vegetables in the summertime. And though, despite the fact that we do, we can and freeze a lot of produce, we felt like we weren't eating as healthily in the winter, and that was because we didn't have access to fresh produce. And so I started doing some research. Let me grab these books right now because we had some questions before. Uh, I, I came across a couple of different books that um, really helped me. The first one is this one. It's by Elliot Coleman and it's called Four Season Harvest. And the second is by Nikki Jabor called Year Round Vegetable Gardener. So if, if you guys happen to be interested in, in picking up those books, uh, those are there as well. And so I read those and, and we really decided that we wanted to try this year round gardening thing. And we live in Utah and we live in a zone 6B garden. So we have pretty hard winters. Nothing like a lot of you, I realize, but um, we do have some pretty hard winners. And I just just to, to show you uh, what is possible. So we started this whole year-round gardening concept in May of 2009. We had our first harvest then of some lettuce and radishes and you know your traditional spring stuff. Since that day, we have had something available in our garden to harvest every day since 
365 days a year, we've, we've always had something that we can harvest. Now, we don't always harvest something every day, obviously, especially in the winter time. We will usually just harvest like once a week on a nice warm day. We'll harvest enough spinach and, and salad greens and carrots and stuff to last us a whole week. But we've always had something available for 13 years now. Um, and for those of you that live in zones 8, 9, and 10, something like this should be pretty easy to do for you guys because you don't have those really severe cold uh, winter times. In zones five through seven, you guys are gonna benefit a ton from this because uh, all of a sudden the, the world opens up to about 30 different crops that you can be growing in the winter time under protection that um, are really gonna help you. And then even those of you in zones three and four, it's gonna be a little bit harder for you guys to pull this off, but there's still a group of crops, you know, a, a dozen or so crops that you can grow in the winter time even in those really severely cold places. Uh, so, uh, you know, just a lot of fun stuff that we can do with this. I love, in, in case you guys haven't noticed, I love talking about this topic. It's it's literally my favorite gardening topic to, to talk about. And so I always look forward to this time of year when we really start um, talking about it. And kind of to maybe answer your question, why in July are we talking about this? It's because for some of us, you may need to start planting um, in just a few weeks. You know, I, I do my first planting of fall carrots and my first planting of fall spinach on August 1st. Um, and so that's what we're going to talk about today, but that's why we're, we're doing this. So how to extend your garden. First thing you need to do is you need to choose the right crops. And that's what we talked about yesterday. So if you missed yesterday's uh, presentation, you can go back and watch that one. Um, I'm going to leave those up for two or three weeks. And so you should be able to go back and watch that anytime. The next thing you have to do is you have to plant at the right time. And that's what we're going to talk about today. And then tomorrow we'll talk about protecting your crops and, and the things that you need to do to protect them from the, that winter weather. Okay. All right. So this, uh, this may sound like a, a funny way to start this discussion, but um, I want to talk about a Greek legend. And I'm going to, I'm going to show you the Four Season Harvest book again because I don't want to claim that, that this story or idea came from me. It came from Elliot Coleman. He talks about and kind of coined the phrase the Parsephone months, okay? So Parsephone was a Greek goddess and um, she was very beautiful and she was the daughter of Demeter who was the goddess of the harvest and of weather and, and things like that. Well, Parsephone was um, attracted or, or, or uh, Hades was attracted to her and he you know, in classic Greek god style, he kidnapped her and forced her to marry her, marry him, and uh, kept her prisoner in hell, basically. And uh, it took a little while for things to get worked out to rescue her. And while she was there, she ate some food. She ate a um, a seed, and uh, apparently, you're not supposed to do that. And so it ended up tying her to the afterlife. And so she ended up having to after all the negotiations happened and they, they got her free from Hades, she ended up that, that she had to go back to um, Hades three months out of the year, okay? And, and during those three months, her mother, Demeter, who is the, the goddess of climate and harvest and everything, mourned. And that, my friends, is why we have winter, according to the Greeks, okay? So the three months that Persephone is in the, the afterlife is when uh, we have winter because Demeter is mourning, okay? Now, that's kind of a fun little story that, that Elliot Coleman did and, and to, to coin the phrase the Parsippany months, okay? So those months are the, the months when our day length here in North America or in, in the Northern Hemisphere, um, when our day length is less than 10 hours a day. So when we have less than 10 hours of total sunlight during the day, we call those the Parsippany months. Usually these will happen sometime between November and February. So for example, for us here in Utah, can't remember, I think we're like 42, 43 degrees north latitude. Um, we, we usually start the Parsippany months about November 7th and end about February 7th. Okay, So that three month time period, we have 10 hours of sunlight or less a day we end up getting down to about nine hours and 10 minutes, if I remember correctly, in December, um, when, when we really kind of hit that low point. And the reason why all of this is important is because 
during that time, nothing grows. Even if we protect it, there's not enough sunlight for most plants to grow, okay? So the whole concept with year-round gardening is if we want to have something to harvest during the winter months, then we have to plant it in time for it to mature before the parsippany months happen, okay? Now, for those of you that live further south, your total time frame may be less than, than ours. You know, it might not be that full three hours. And for those of you that live farther north, it could be even longer than that. But essentially, the 10 hours of sunlight is kind of the important thing. So the whole idea here is that in order for us to have a successful winter crop, we have to have everything to maturity before those 10 hour days arrive because after those 10 hour or less days arrive we have very little growth in our plants and so if 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 they're not mature and ready to eat at that stage they're not going to be mature until spring because there just isn't enough light okay so essentially is what we're doing is we're get, bringing them to maturity and then we're keeping them in cold storage. So we're protecting them with, with hoop houses and row covers and cold frames, keeping them in cold storage. And so the whole idea here and the whole timing and, and is for us to have those things ready before those 10 hour days arrive, okay? Now, the most important concept uh, here is, and we, we talk a lot about zones and garden zones are, are super, super popular um, and people talk about them a lot, but ultimately when we're talking about winter gardening, frost date is more important. Your first frost date is ultimately the, the, the thing that's going to drive when you start planting your crops, okay? So all of our planting times are based on this date. So I've included on this slide the names of, of three different uh, gardening websites that you can go to. One is called Morning Chores, the other is the Farmer, Farmer's Almanac, and then the other is Garden.org. Any of those, if you just Google those, Morning Chores Frost Date or Farmer's Almanac Frost Date, it will take you to their page where it will give you a frost date calculator. So you put your zip code in and it will tell you approximately when your first frost date is. Now, the frustrating thing about this method is all three of those websites give you a different date for the same zip code. Um, I'm not sure why they're all crunching different databases, I guess, but they all give you different dates, some quite a bit apart. So my recommendation would be use those as, a, as an initial guide, but ask around. So ask some other gardeners in your area, maybe call your extension agency and ask them you should be able to say, hey, I live in Salt Lake City, Utah. When is my first frost date? And they should be able to give you a pretty good approximation of when your average first frost date is. That's what we're targeting when we're dealing with planting um, for these fall and winter crops, okay? So target time for planting is six to eight weeks before your first frost, okay? So for the cabbage family, so this would be things like cabbage, broccoli, cauliflower, Brussels sprouts, kohlrabi, those, we will be planting those by transplants. So you either need to buy some transplants or you need to get transplants started now. Um, and go check my on my YouTube channel. You can look. I, I just did a video two weeks ago about planting uh, these types of crops indoors and, and kind of gave you a bit of a schedule. But now for most of this is the time to get those started indoors. And so cabbage family, we want to do transplants. Everything else, lettuce, spinach, carrots, beets, turnips, um, Swiss chard, kale, collards, all of those other plants that, that we're, we talked about yesterday can be planted by seed directly in the garden or you can plant them indoors. And the reason why you might choose to plant them indoors is because you may not have enough space outside. So if your garden is anything like mine, um, at this target date, there's, there's not a lot of space yet. And so I actually will do kind of a mix of outdoor and indoor planting with a lot of these crops. Now, one other thing that I wanted to make sure that you guys recognize is that you need to add 15 days to the maturity date of your plants. So if you turn over a seed package, it'll say 
um, you know, planted from transplants, these mature in 100 days, or planted from seed, these mature in 75 days. You know, it'll say that on the back of your seed package. You need to, in the fall, you need to add 15 days to that date. And the reason why is because in the spring, when those dates are calculated, the sunlight is going up and we're getting more and more and more sunlight as the spring progresses to, towards summer. We're having the exact opposite thing happen in the fall. So we're going down, 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 down on the light. And so that lack of light extends the maturity dates. So let me give you some examples here. I have a favorite broccoli that we really like to grow. It's called Watham, okay? The maturity date for Watham broccoli is 100 to 110 days. That's way too long for planting in the fall. Trust me, I know this from experience. Um, so, so you need to look at the maturity dates of the plants that you're intending to grow and you need to find plants that grow that have shorter maturity dates. So instead of Watham, which is a, a great little heirloom broccoli that we really like, instead for the fall I plant a variety called Pac-Man. And Pac-Man is a hybrid and it matures in about 60 to 70 days. See the difference? That's a full month, almost 40 days difference in maturity. And so we have to choose those shorter maturing varieties. So no 120 day cabbages. Instead, we want to go with the, you know, like the golden acres or the red acres or things like that, that um, mature in 60 to 80 days. Uh, we want to shorten those maturity dates as much as we can because we just run out of sunlight for some of those crops in the fall, okay? So just make sure that you recognize that as you are going through. Now, the other thing that you need to remember is we are talking here about cool season crops, okay? We're not going to be planting squash or tomatoes or eggplant or beans in the wintertime outdoors, okay? It's just not going to happen. You, you, the, the only thing you could do is to have a heated greenhouse, which becomes very, very expensive. And even then, in the northern latitudes, you're going to struggle because, again, we don't have a lot of sunlight. So we're not talking warm season crops here. Instead, we're talking things like leafy greens, all of the cabbage family crops, and all of the root crops. So carrots and beets and radishes and parsnips and things like that, okay? Cool season crops is what we are going to be planting in the fall. Um, not those warm seasons. So don't bother with the warm seasons. They're all going to die. Okay. Um, let me see what I intended with this slide. This is kind of our last slide here. So I, is what I want to do is I want to give you an example of what we uh, what we do here in our Zone Six Utah garden. So our average last frost date for my garden is roughly October first. Sometimes it slides all the way to about October 15th, so I've got a little bit of a window there, but we're pretty consistent, like three years out of five, October 1st is when we have our first frost, okay? So if we're going to plant six to eight weeks, remember if we go back here to this slide, um, our start planting times are six to eight weeks before our first frost date. Uh, that means that for us, we are going to be planting, starting our plantings for fall and winter crops about August 1st. Taking eight weeks off of October 1st gets us August 1st. Now, there is a little bit of wiggle room, okay? The only, the only real crop that I would say there isn't wiggle room on is carrots. Um, for some reason, if I get my carrots planted late, they don't mature in time. So eight weeks for sure on carrots, but everything else has some wiggle room. So you've got two to maybe three weeks wiggle room in, in, in that planting time. So I've planted some crops as late as August 20th and still had a good winter and fall and winter harvest, okay? So we've got a little bit of wiggle room there and that's why I say six to eight weeks, but that's our, our target. So if your first frost is November 1st, then you're gonna be targeting September 1st as your planting time, okay? And so, and then for the, again, for those those broccoli family, we're gonna be putting transplants out. And I usually wait until about six weeks before, just to kind of hopefully see the last of the 100 degrees and, and we get things a little bit cooler um, for those those transplants of the, of the broccoli family, okay? So that is our 
timing and and it's going to work out for you know nearly all of you those of you that are in warmer zones are also more more than likely going to be south unless you happen to live in the pacific northwest but most of you will will be further south and that means you'll have you know less time until the or more time until those 10 hour days come and so you'll be able to plant a little bit later now if you wanted to just overwinter some crops you can actually sneak those in as late as maybe like four weeks to maybe even as, as late as two weeks before your first frost. But recognize you'll, you'll be overwintering those. So they'll grow in the spring. They're gonna do a little bit of growing in the fall. You'll protect them over the winter and then they'll mature in the spring for those really late plantings, okay? Now, I did also want to really quickly talk about some things that you can do for spring planting. And this is kind of just a general idea. And again, tomorrow we're gonna to talk about hoop houses and cold frames and how to use them and, and how to build them. But kind of general concept with our spring gardens, if you have a hoop house or a cold frame, you ought to be able to plant about four to six weeks sooner than everybody else in your area. So again, you'll be able to start, you know, for example, you know, outdoors, we will normally not really start things until about April 1st, uh, but in my cold frames and in my hoop houses, I, you know, I'm looking at mid-February to the 1st of March. And so uh, having these, you know, devices and, and doing this concept will also allow you to bump up your spring planting times as well, okay? All right, so that is all I have for today's presentation. I feel like it was a little bit shorter than the others. Um, let me just really quickly, let's talk a little bit about the year-round gardening master course. So for those of you that haven't already heard, um, we have the, the year-round gardening master course open currently for enrollment uh, and it's going to be open until Friday. So time is getting short. Uh, we only open it once a year, uh, just the first couple of weeks of, of July and we are closing it on Friday and starting the course on Monday morning. So um, you definitely need to kind of hurry and make that happen. Uh, let me tell you what's in it. So it has, now this is all pre-recorded. So you can watch it at your leisure. Um, so it's not like you're gonna have to show up for a live like we did today or something like that. It's about five and a half hours worth of instruction that we break down over four weeks. So we have a weekly study guide over four weeks that we go through. And then I also do Q and A sessions. So we're gonna get on a Zoom call and you guys can ask me all the questions that you have related to year round gardening. We also have a little private Facebook group. You don't have to be a part of that. It's just kind of a perk that goes along with it because I know a lot of people aren't on Facebook anymore. Um, course opens July 5th and closes on July 15th. So you just have three more days to get signed up. Um, regular price for this course is $69. Because you guys have joined us here in this workshop, um, I'm gonna give you a break. So we're gonna go with $59. So you can save $10 off the price um, through July 15th. One other thing, uh, we had a discussion this morning and this, this is gonna be the last year that we are pricing this course at $69. Um, so now is a good time to join um, because we are gonna bump the price up next year. Um, so on top of that, if you sign up today using the code, so there's a, a code in the description uh, of this video uh, it's got lots of arrows and everything pointing to it so that you can see it. It's down below. If you use that code and you buy before the end of the day today, you will get a free course as well. This is my succession planting course. It goes along really well with the year-round gardening course. It's just a, a, like a half hour long course that um, you get for free if you get signed up today. So make sure you go and join, okay? All right, enough selling. I'm going <laughs> to move on and let's do some more fun stuff and answer some questions. It looks like we already have 10 or 15 questions. Um, let's announce our, our prize winners for today. Um, again, thank you to Honest Seed Company and Smart Pots for sponsoring these prizes. Honest Seed Company gave us three $25 gift certificates um, and uh, Smart Pots gave us two Smart Pots. So thank you to both of you for uh, that and um, go check out those companies as well. They are great companies and, and have been super supportive of us. All right, so let's look at who our winners are today now. Um, for some reason, most of our winners today chose to only give me their first name, but I have your email address, so I know who you are. Um, so the $25 gift certificates go to uh, Marion, Nancy, and Cindy Martin, and the smart pots go to Deborah and David. Um, so that 
is it for this time. Congratulations, everybody. I will contact everybody via email. Probably, to be honest with you, I won't get to it until maybe Friday or Saturday, but I will contact everybody via email and get your um, information so that we can get you your prizes, okay? All right, questions. First off, let me answer a couple of questions related to the um, year-round gardening course. So the 69 or $59, that is flat cost, okay? So um, it's not per year or anything like that. That's just, you just get, it's one-time purchase and you get you get to keep the course and you'll get to participate in future years if you want. But it's a it's a pre-recorded course, so it you know you you get it and and you have access to it anytime you want. Okay. And then this is different than the gardening academy. So the year-round um, year-round gardening course is different than the gardening academy. The gardening academy is our monthly membership service. Um, great little uh, thing that has we we have like literally twenty or thirty gardening courses in uh, there now. Um, and I'll, you know, um, I talk about that quite a bit as well. Uh, it's it's a fun place to go, and there is a link down there uh, for that as well. Uh, but it is totally different than the year-round gardening course, and and uh, so uh, it, two different things. Um, but uh, year-round gardening is focused just on year-round gardening. The gardening academy we cover just a ton of different um, topics. Okay, all right. So let's do. What do I have? Yeah. Okay. Um, we'll go back here. Let's do some questions. So get my other computer over here so that we can see. Um, so Cheryl is saying, I'm concerned that if I start my indoor seeds now, um, that you'll get aphids. How can you avoid this? OK, um, so a couple of different things. And that's one of the things we talk about in the, the year-round gardening course is we, we do have some additional challenges pest-wise uh, that we don't usually struggle with on these cool season crops in the fall. Uh, one of the things that I recommend is when we're starting those seedlings that you cover them either with a bug netting or with a light fabric row cover. Either one of those is going to be very effective at keeping pests out. Um, I have a big bed of kale that we have been growing since March and we've had it covered with a hoop that has a light fabric row cover on it and we have yet to get aphids in that bed. Um, it, it just keeps them out. So there, there are bug knittings out there or just light fabric row cover, either one of those over a hoop or just thrown directly over the crops. Uh, that is going to aid with germination and it's also going to help to keep those pests away, okay? Um, all right, so Laura is saying, I don't have a green thumb. I'd like to learn how to grow from grocery store produce cuttings and seeds. Okay. Um, the growing from grocery store cuttings is fun. It's kind of a fun little concept, but it's not productive. Um, it, it's not the best way to do things. There, there are a few crops that do okay, like you can get green onions to come back and, and do all right. But ultimately, those are fun little experiments that you see on Instagram but they're really not the most productive way to do things. Instead, you should be buying fresh seed for plants that are actually meant to grow in the garden and start them from seed, okay? And also, using the seeds from your grocery store produce is never a, a really productive idea either because um, those plants are most likely hybrids. And when you plant those seeds, you are not gonna get the same plant. Um, so hybrid seeds are not stable in the second generation, and so if you try and plant them, um, the, those seeds will not continue. They won't. They won't produce the same tomatoes. So, so you may plant a you know a nice big tomato, and the the seeds from that will end up producing the next year just a little tomato. It's obviously still going to give you a tomato, but um, it's it's never a really good idea to do that, even with organic, because organic doesn't mean not hybrids. Okay, Hi hybrids are different than GMO. Um, and, and so, you know, it, even organic produce might be a hybrid. And so you need to um, just not do that. The only exception that I might make there would be garlic. Um, even potatoes you're gonna struggle with because they're probably have been treated. So I, I would stay away from that and I would buy fresh seeds and fresh, you know, garden seeds, okay? Um, also, uh, you don't know entirely what zones are. 
um, and wonder what the gui guidelines vary from zone to zone. Um, so if you're in 9B, that's a, a really nice warm zone. Um, jump down, jump over to our website, Our Stony Acres, and then just Google or, or just search garden zones. I have a really good article that I wrote a couple of years ago about garden zones. It includes a, a link that you can go out to the USDA website or the Canada website or even there's some European websites and get your garden zone there. And, and it gives a pretty good de definition of garden zones, okay? Um, Letha is saying, with our unusual weather this year, would you rely on the recommendations in the Farmer, Farmer, Farmer's Almanac for this fall and winter or take it with a grain of salt? Um, I, the, the Farmer's Almanac is fun and it's been done literally for centuries, but you know, there, it's best guess um, for for that kind of stuff, and so um, yeah, I, I would you know you just need to pay close attention to your own weather and use these planting dates. Uh, you know your frost date is going to be your target, and kind of go from there. Um, all right, what about zone four B? Is that close enough to zone five? Yes, probably. And you you'll be able to do in zone four B. And this is uh, Mama Preps that's asking this you'll be able to do quite a bit. You just won't, um, you know, like lettuce is not gonna last long for you. Um, spinach, totsoy, kale, collards, um, mosh, claytonia, carrots are all still gonna do really well for you. There's just some of the, the more tender crops that just aren't gonna overwinter as well for you. And then you'll, the, the amount of time that you have to harvest will also be a little rougher in those colder zones because it, in order to, to harvest the, the crops, your cold frame or your hoop house needs to be warm. Um, so it needs to be above freezing, and that happens less often in your areas than it does in like my area, for example. So um, there, there are some added difficulties in those colder areas, but it's not impossible to do the, the winter gardening there as well. Um, okay. Um, I have to avoid putting a cold frame in an area that the dogs have used pretty regularly for their business. Um, if they're still currently using it, then probably you should. Um, I would clean all of that manure out. The, the, the problem with, with dog and cat manure in particular is um, they carry a lot of pathogens that are often not good for us uh, as, as humans because, because they're um, you know meat eaters they they'll carry pathogens in their stomachs that that then passes into their manure that is not great for us um, and so unlike cows and horse and sheep and rabbits that are all herbivores um, that's, that's why we don't use cat manure and dog manure in our compost and things like that so I mean you could do a couple of things number one if you cleared it out and let the weather you know kind of wash things away for a year or so you would be fine uh, the other thing is is you could put a raised bed over the top of that area um, but if, if you really want to garden in that area you need to keep the dogs out somehow and then kind of let things get washed away a little bit it would be my recommendation on that um, okay so Um, your tomato plants are half my height at least and I'm six foot tall and they barely have any fruit growing so sad um, okay this is Jalesa I hopefully I said that right um, so probably um, you 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 may have over there's a couple of things that may have caused that um, possibly over fertilized or over watered I, I, I tell the story all the time but I had a neighbor years ago, it's been about 10 plus years ago, that called me over and said, hey, my, I've got these two tomato plants and they're just not producing at all. They're huge, but they're not producing. Would you come look at them? So I went over and looked at them. Literally, guys, these two plants combined were the size of a Volkswagen. They were huge, just giant. Two plants took up their entire four by eight foot garden bed. It was just huge, no fruit at all. And come to find out they were watering that garden with their sprinklers from their lawn and so it was getting watered every day and so the plant focused solely on producing green and no fruit okay so that could be what's going on uh, the other thing is is you may have over fertilized and again that will cause it to um, produce more fruit uh, the other thing it could be that you're just in a really hot spell if you're like us we're not getting any fruit set on our tomatoes right now either and that's because it's 100 degrees 
and fruit stops setting at about 85, 90 degrees. And so one thing that you could consider doing is getting some shade cloth, maybe like a 70%, sorry, opposite of that, 30% shade cloth and put that over your tomatoes, maybe suspended over it. That'll bring the temperature down and hopefully that will help them to get their fruit set, okay? Um, all right, um, could I put a visual of the books up with the authors and the website? It's really hard to catch when you're listening and taking notes. I can, I can go through it again really quick. I don't have a way of putting a visual up live, all of those slides I prepared in advance. But the first one is, you know what? I don't need to be small anymore. Let's go big. This might help. Um, first one is Elliot Coleman's Four Season Harvest. Second one is Nikki Jabor, Year-Round Vegetable Gardener. And there's Nikki's name right there. Nikki, N-I-K-K-I-J-A-B. B O U R. Okay, both really good books. Um, there's several others out there, but those are my two favorite. Um, very, very good. Go through and, and talk about a lot of stuff. Um, all right, uh, Pacific North. I live in the Pacific Northwest. Lots of clouds and way too much rain. What can I plant? I've built a hoop house to eliminate the rain issue. So in the Pacific Northwest, in the wintertime, you should be able to grow a lot of stuff. You, you have fairly mild weather, even though you're further north than we are, um, you probably have milder weather than we do. And so all of the leafy greens should do really well in a hoop house in the Pacific Northwest. Um, even carrots, tomato, or carrots, um, turnips, beets, things like that should do really well uh, for you in the wintertime as well. Anyone have a good spray for lantern fly nymphs? Um, tried a strong solution of Dawn, but they're still there. Okay, um, insecticidal soaps are very good for soft-bodied um, insects, but you shouldn't use Dawn, okay? Instead, you should use a natural soap. So look for like Dr. Bonner's Castile soap. The reason why is because of the, the ingredients. Um, the, the, the ingredients in the natural soaps are, are better for destroying those, the bodies of those soft body bugs. So I think it probably is the fact that you've used the wrong soap in your spray mixture. So um, Dr. Bonner's Castile soap, any flavor if you want, or you can just do the, the basic, any of those that comes in a liquid, um, and, and that would probably be the best for that type of um, spray. Um, and searching for a spray against chemtrails. I don't know what chemtrails are. Um, again, if they're a soft-bodied bug, you could use an insecticidal soap. And when you use the Dr. Bonner's soap, it's organic as well. So it qualifies as organic um, and, and, and is a good choice for you there, okay? Uh, Laura is asking collards. What do I do with them after they've gone to flower? Um, once they've gone to flower, I just pull them out. They're not gonna produce as well uh, they're, you know, they, they, they get tough, they get bitter. I would just pull them out and start over, you know, plant, plant another planting of them if, if you want that, okay? When do you plant garlic for fall harvest in spring, okay? So garlic is nearly never harvested in the spring unless you live in somewhere really, really warm. Uh, normally garlic is, is harvested roughly around now. So I harvested my garlic about a week ago. Um, in, in some of the warmer zones, like seven and eight, you probably maybe a month ago you were harvesting. So it's usually early summer that garlic is ready and you plant it after your frost date, okay? So totally opposite thinking of, of everything else we've talked about, but your, your, your garlic is usually planted after your frost date, your first frost date, but before the ground freezes hard, okay? So for us, we plant ours in November. Um, early November, usually one year we went as late as Thanksgiving, but that was a little late. Um, but for us, you know, about a month after our, our last frost date is what works for, for us. So, um, you know, just kind of wait till things cool off a bit. Um, Liz says, I started some fall and winter seeds indoors in my unfinished garage. It's currently 80 degrees in there. How long should I keep the grow lights on? Well, you, the, the grow lights should be on um, 12, well, 14 hours a day. So, so I like to run mine 14 to 16 hours a day. Uh, so that's how long. And then you're just going to leave them on until they're ready to be transplanted out. So uh, you'll, you'll want to run them for about, you know, two-thirds of the day, 14 to 16 hours. And, uh, and, and 80 degrees is not ideal, 
but it's it's going to be okay for for those seedlings um, because you'll you'll end up taking them out and they'll mature um, out in the garden. Okay. Um, all right. Uh, Rick, do you do anything to protect your young seedlings from the heat when you plant them outside? I get nervous uh, that they would just bolt. Okay. So I I really watch my temperatures. Uh, so that that's one thing when I plant my seedlings in the fall, I make sure that I put them in a big container because if we happen to, you know, there's some years, middle of August is still really hot for us. Sometimes we're still in the, you know, the 90s. Usually by then the hundreds have gone away, but we could still be in the 90s. And so I want to be flexible. Um, and, and so I plant them in bigger containers, usually in like the three inch square containers that um, give me a little more flexibility that they won't get root bound too quick. And then I just watch my temperatures. And once things start to cool off and those 90s kind of break away and we fall into the 80s, uh, the, the, a lot of the signals that are going to be causing them to bolt go away in the fall. So it starts getting cooler and less light instead of warmer and more light. That's what triggers things to bolt. Um, it's, we're getting the exact opposite. And so I've never really had other than um, bok choy. Bok choy just likes to bolt. <laughs> but uh, other than bok choy, I, I've never really had a bolting problem with my transplants in, in the fall. Okay. Um, all right. And, and I guess, you know, the other thing that I would say there is you do need to baby them. Um, so, you know, you're going to make sure you water them consistently and you're just real careful with them uh, early on. Maybe some shade cloth if it, you know, if you have a hot spell come in. But usually within two or three weeks of planting, the weather has started to break and you should be okay. Um, all right. Suzanne asks, I have an established bed that gets less sun than a brand new bed that gets more sun. Which one would you recommend? I'm concerned about the soil nutrients on the new one versus the sun. Um, well, the, the new bed, you know, if, if it's fairly new, there's probably still plenty of nutrients in that soil that you'll just continue to improve. So either one is going to be okay. Less sun is less desirable for the winter months. Um, you want to have some sun. And so if that bed is going to be shaded in the winter, that's probably not the right choice. We do want to have some sun because we, we need it to get warm enough inside our cold frames and our hoop houses to thaw our plants out before we harvest. So I would I would probably try and choose the sunnier bed if you could. And and put some compost in before you plant and you know just keep working on that new bed and you'll you'll get it uh, there and the soil will be okay. Can uh, Sharon's asking can beginner gardeners join? Do you need any previous gardening experience? Well um, my opinion is that everybody is an experienced gardener because you're just gonna you know, the best way to become an experienced gardener is to kill lots of plants. Um, that's green thumbs are earned. And so, yes, I think that it would be great. Um, this is a slightly more advanced topic, but, you know, it, it's all still growing and, and it's, it's going to be good experience for you and, and, you know, a good way for you to learn. So uh, you definitely could join as well. Okay. Um, all right. Uh, Linda Pryor is asking about the Gardening Academy costs. So Gardening Academy, we have three different ways you can join. We have an annual, a semi-annual, or a monthly. Uh, annual is normal price is $250. Uh, semi-monthly is, I think, $135. And then the monthly is $25. So those are the options there. And there is a link down in the description of this video you can click on to go check that out if you're, if you're interested. But I'm not here to hard sell you on that. I want you to come do the year-round gardening course. Um, can you plant open-pollinated open seeds of different types of tomatoes? For example, will they cross-pollinate? So then the seeds would you saved would be hybrids. There is a slim chance that you can cross-pollinate seeds, um, for sure. But um, uh, tomatoes are not predominantly bee-pollinated. Instead, they're wind-pollinated. And so it's not a huge concern, but it, it, I, my recommendation would be in that case, if you're wanting to sp save specific seeds, um, try to just save one type of seed per year and isolate that plant. Just give it some distance. Um, you know, plant it on the other side of your garden, 
plant it in a container in the front of your property or, you know, or something like that. Give it a little space and you'll be fine. Um, tomatoes are, are not really heavily pollinated or pollinated. They're wind pollinated. So it should be okay, but I, I, would, I would rather you not save seeds from a, a big grouping of tomatoes and instead try to isolate the one you're going to save seeds for. Sorry, thank you. <clears throat> okay, um, shoot, Liz, I'll, I'll fix that link. Sorry, it looks like the link for the Gardening Academy is broken. I must have uh, copied it in wrong, so I'll, I'll fix that as soon as we're done with this video. Um, 4B, should I be growing my fall crops in a hoop house or a cold frame? In 4B, um, mm, I mean, some things you have to grow in a hoop house, like if you're going to grow kale or collards or maybe Swiss chard, uh, they're big enough that you need a hoop house. But f for 4B, my biggest question would be, um, would be, uh, or my, my biggest recommendation, sorry, I lost my tra train of thought here, reading different questions. My, my train of, or my, my thoughts on for 4B would be a cold frame is ultimately going to be better for you because a cold frame offers more protection. It's lower profile for the wind um, and, and the snow load and things like that. And so, Cold frame probably in 4B is going to be your better choice. Okay, we'll talk more about that tomorrow. Um, okay, I missed one. How do signed up for the year-round gardening class yesterday? How do I link to the bonus class? Um, it should be Honeydew. It should be in. It should already be in your profile. I, I uploaded everybody's yesterday. If I missed you, send me an email and I will. Um, I'll, I'll get it fixed. But uh, I, I think everybody that signed up yesterday, I've already added the bonus class too, so it should already be there when you log into the account, okay? Um, all right, new to gardening, first year having a small garden. Um, I did use heirloom and non-GMO seeds. Is there a resource for learning how to save seeds? Yes, there is. Um, I have a course on that, and I feel that feels cheap. To, to do that, but I actually do have a little seed saving course. It's it's a, a fairly inexpensive one. You can just go to the online gardening school, um, and there's a there's a course there. Uh, there's also several really good books out there as well on seed saving. Seed Saver Exchange has a, a good book. Um, so lots of good resources out there to learn how to save your own seeds. Okay. Um, and uh, do I have links for the sponsors today? I thought I'd put those in. I, if I didn't, I apologize. So it's Honest Seed Company and uh, Smart Pots, and they're both just honestseedcompany.com and smartpots.com is your links. Um, what about saving the seeds from the collards? Um, yes, you could save the seeds from those collards as long as they haven't been, you know, cross pollinated with something else. So as long as no other brassica family plants have been in bloom at the same time, you should be okay. So if your broccoli hasn't gone to seed, your cabbage, your cauliflower, your Asian greens, anything like that, as long as you haven't had any cross-pollination in your yard, then you should be able to save those seeds and they should be fine. Um, saved a folder, or I saved about half of the folders. Let me start over. I saved about half a, fol a Folgers can of red wheat from a commercial bird seed mix. I kind of just dumped it on the ground for my birds. Can I plant any wheat in the fall? Um, I'm not a farmer. There, there's spring wheats that you can plant uh, in the fall that will that will grow up, um, but you'd have to do a little research on that yourself. Um, I, I know a lot of farmers grow. I, I did grow up farming, but but it was potato and hay farming that we did. Um, a lot of farmers will grow spring wheat, so there's specific varieties that you plant in the fall. They come up early in the spring, but um, you'll have to do a little research on that one. Sorry. Um, should we wait for the first leaves to show before using the grow lights? No. Um, turn the grow lights on. I usually turn the grow lights on on day two um, so that there's immediately light as soon as they come up. You want to have those grow lights on immediately so that it's just trying, you're trying to replicate what would be happening outside. And if they were outside, there would be some light immediately when they came up. You want them to have light so that they stay stocky and don't get um, leggy. Okay. Um, your cilantro was doing good and now it has bolted. It makes, this makes it coriander and how do you harvest? Yes, so um, when cilantro bolts, the seeds are coriander, what we call coriander. You're gonna wanna let those seed heads dry out um, and then, so, so wait for them to mature on the plant 
and then you're going to let them dry out and then you should be able to just harvest those seeds and use them as coriander okay and then if you want to to you can plant um, cilantro again in the fall uh, because it it likes the cooler weather um, Caleb is answering how do seed how do I save seeds for my cauliflower I let one go to seed and it has a small green pods can they be used this fall yeah you need to wait for those green pods to brown um, so they're they're going to turn brown and 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 the, the seeds will get loose and shaky inside and then you should be able to, to use those in the fall uh, as long as they get dry soon enough. Um, they may not make it um, this late in the year if they're still green. Um, Mary is asking, uh, I'm in zone 7B, when can I plant lettuce? So that is based on your frost date, six to eight weeks before your first frost date is when you're going to plant those. Um, and then I will, I'll try and get some links posted. Um, how do you go directly to the class? Can I get an email address from there? Um, so the, the class, the link for the class is down in the description. I put lots of arrows pointing to it, so you should be able to see that down there. Um, how do you know when spinach seeds are ready for harvest? Spinach is one that I haven't saved seeds on yet, and so I, I you're going to have to look that one up. Unfortunately, I can't give you the answer to that one. I'm not going to try and fake it. So uh, I, 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 I'm assuming it's the same kind of concept as most of the other seeds. You wait until the seed head is dried out and those seeds are dry and then you're harvesting them. Uh, and then do I talk about cover crops? Uh, not in the year-round gardening class. Um, I do spend a little bit of time occasionally on cover crops. Uh, I, I struggle with cover crops because it's really hard for us to plant them in our area just because um, we we have a very we go from summer to fall almost or summer to winter almost immediately we have a very short fall and so the cover crops don't do super well um, but uh, yeah I, I, I do know a little bit about them but I, I I'm not a pro with cover crops by any stretch okay all right um, let me just look and see if there's any other questions that's all the ones that are on the list I'm just checking to make sure I didn't Listening. Okay, good. Wow, 165 people still here. That's awesome, guys. Thank you for being here, and I appreciate it. Um, my email, uh, Melissa, is rick at ourstonyacres.com. So O-U-R-S-T-O-N-E-Y-A-C-R-E-S.com. Rick at ourstonyacres.com. Um, and then I will... Um, I will, it looks like I must have missed some links on, on this video description, so I apologize. I'll go immediately after I finish this, I'll go add those links and make sure that they're working. Um, so, okay, so uh, just really quick, uh, remember, let me shrink myself back down here. Um, oh, that didn't work. There we go. Oh, totally did it wrong. There. Um, okay, so let's go, uh, the, the discount on the year-round gardening master course ends on July 15th which is Friday um, and so the discount is good until Friday the bonus course is only good today on that link so you need to sign up today if you want to get that bonus course and then don't forget that tomorrow we will do our last of these uh, webinars and um, we will be talking about protecting your fall and winter crops and we're going to do that at 2 p.m. tomorrow so it looks like I really got things messed up there um, so that I think my friends is all that we have for today um, thank you for being here uh, awesome class great questions uh, really appreciate you guys being here make sure you go sign up for the year-round gardening master course it's a lot of fun gives you an opportunity to get a little bit more direct interaction with me because we do zoom calls instead of you know the YouTube feed and stuff like that so uh, it's a really good course we already have over a hundred people like hundred and six people uh, last time I checked have joined so we're gonna have a really good group this year with lots of people there's lots of energy and it's gonna be a lot of fun so please go and join us down below okay all right thank you guys appreciate you being here and so many people sticking for so long too um, that's awesome so thanks again we'll see you tomorrow at two o'clock for the last of these workshops until then happy gardening thanks guys